like to go ahead and call this meeting to order and ask for roll. Mayor Sanchez. Present. Deputy Mayor Kime. Here. Council Member Joyce. Present. Council Member Robinson. Here. Council Member Weiss. Here. Thank you. Uh, please, please stand for the invocation. To, to, today we have Trace Martinez, OPD chaplain. Yes. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, let's pray together. Uh, gracious and loving God, I stand before you today on behalf of the city of Oceanside. Pray for your grace and your mercy to rest upon this city. Pray this would be a place marked by love, by charity, by generosity, and unity. I ask for your protection over this city and pray for safety and health all around. Thank you for every person that selflessly serves this beautiful city. I ask that you would be with those here today in the proceedings that are about to commence. Would you grant them wisdom and direction so that they might lead well? Unify them around the common goal of serving the people of Oceanside and helping this to be a wonderful environment to live, work, and play. Thank you for another day of life and for gathering us. Pray your blessings here today. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Um, please remain standing for the Pledge of Allegiance. We, today we have the captain of the o OHS Boys Soccer. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Thank you. You may be seated. And yes, I did say OHS boys soccer, so they are in the house, champions. with their fantastic coach, Frank Zimmerman, also in the house. So keep that enthusiasm up as we hear first from Main Street Oceanside. Come on down, Gumaro. Good evening, I think it's in here, right? Well, good evening. My name is Gumaro Skarsega, the CEO of Main Street Oceanside. Thank you, Honorable Mayor, for having us here and council members. Uh, so Main Street Oceanside Design Committee um, has been working on this project for about six months or so. Uh, this project was designated for us to do something with this facade here of this uh, entrance of the parking structure located on Seagates and Cleveland Street. Um, so before I go on to that, so <laughs> uh, this is a unique wall, and basically we went through about 22 muralists to, we vetted, and we selected the top five to submit their final submissions to this project. Uh, the top three were selected by the design committee and some advisors. Uh, these top three had no relationship with or the organization or anything. This is, was an inclusive process that we went CD and regional to make sure that we attracted the best of the best of the of muralists here. Um, so with that said, this is the top three finalists that I'm presenting you guys. Um, at the end, there is a QR code. We're launching voting today. Um, and I'll explain to you, once you guys go into the voting, there's more information because we're having the last voting day to be on Saturday, April 13th. Um, that's gonna be where you come and visit and, and meet the artists, the top three artists. We're gonna have it at the rooftop at Pierceside South. We're gonna have catering by Oceanside Kitchen Collaborative. And we're gonna have open uh, voting that day. And that will be the final day the community can come and vote for this, for this project. But Johnny Pucci is a San Diegan artist. Uh, he's done a lot of worldwide and uh, or international muralists, very famous. Um, so he, Johnny Pucci is one of the submissions that were uh, accepted to be in the top three. The second artist here is Mike Smack, a local artist here. Uh, this is a uh, really cultural-driven um, 
uh, mural to represent our Latino community. Um, very nice scene here. Uh, this is an image of underneath the water that was taken and then created this cultural mural with the uh, low rider here. The third mural is uh, from Nicholas Danger McPherson, out of wild, somewhere in the region here um, in Riverside. However, he has done a lot of work here in Oceanside with some of the businesses. Uh, this is a youthful, fun kind of event, uh, mural that he created. Uh, this is a, a, the octopus is basically is so, uh, you know, uh, forgot the word I'm trying to use here, but uh, they're amazing uh, creatures in the, in the sea. And so we put this, you know, laughing kind of a shark here, image here. But it seems fun, family friendly. Uh, people can definitely enjoy this scene here as well. So with that said, I would like to use today's date in front of you council members and mayor, basically place your vote if this was even better. So I'm not even sure if you're gonna read this because that read really well this earlier before I came in here. So, so try to see if your phone can read it. So if you guys have a phone, does it work? It's awesome. So yeah, so go ahead and place your vote today. And, uh, and also we would like to invite everybody to come attend at the Hearside South rooftop on Saturday, April 13th from three to five and enjoy a nice scene in downtown Oceanside. Is that what, no, it's gonna be in today, but at seven o'clock is happy when I have a lunch, but this is where you wanna be. Should have been out, but um, I'll make sure to fix that here. And but, the announcement of the winner will be on. So the announcement of the winner will be at the, on May 3rd at Seabird, where the Oceanside Cultural District is gonna be presenting uh, basically uh, the winner of this contest and uh, during the Oceanside Culture District, I want to say an announcement too that they have sponsored and, and the Arts Commission are equally sponsoring this mural to, to, to put it out there with the community. And so I also want to thank the Main Street Board of Directors and Design Committee for putting all this time to put this together as well. So, uh, but please vote and uh, let the community select the winner of this project. So vote and vote often, or how many times can you vote? Well, per device is one, but okay. if you guys want to do multi-voting, you know, voting, go ahead. You can use your phone, your iPad. Some of the shows you can vote once a day or a couple of times a day. I don't know. Um, no? Well, it's it's once, a, once per device, but, you know, again, we're okay. gonna, we want the community of Oceanside to really come out and vote because there's going to be a lot of their support coming outside of Oceanside because we're now limiting on the geographic area. However, we, we do have the ability to make sure that we can track who's voting. So if you guys are being malice and just voting for one, we're going to flag that as well. So please be aware. Just vote once. You know, let the process, uh, you know, select the winner here. So this is the Oceanside Transit Center. You all have a chance to say, what is it going to look like? Which art? Thank you, Gamaro. Thank, Thank you, you for coming Appreciate in. Appreciate your time. That. Thank you. Next, Woo. OHS, OHS Boys Soccer. They are the champions for the Southern California uh, Regional. So come on down, you guys, come on down. You are champs. We also have our, our coaches here. In fact, Coach Zimmerman, I am going to be handing the mic to you so you can present your champs, our champs. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, City Council. And uh, most of all, thank you to the community. Um, come on in, boys. You're the stars. Let me get out of the way here. Um, we felt so much support, honestly, during this run. And it's crazy how social media can, can be what it can be, but it's been <laughs> ridiculous. I, I'm getting stopped at the Walmart, at the, at the dentist. <laughs> People are recognizing us all over the place, uh, checking in, alumni checking in all over the country, um, sending their, their words of support. And it's important to note that uh, this group of young boys, um, seniors, uh, juniors, and sophomores, um, they, they benefited from this city doing what it's done to help us uh, achieve 
what we need to with regard to allowing great playing facilities for kids. As a matter of fact, most of these boys, uh, every one of our starters actually, and almost every boy here got their start playing on the, on the city fields at Mance Buchanan Park, at MLK Park. And in fact, eight of the, um, uh, eight of the uh, 11 starters play on the same Oceanside Breakers team. But every one of the starters and almost every boy here started playing for our club here in Oceanside on the city fields. You know, recently the city celebrated the Pop Warner Championship. Same thing can be said. We, we need more fields. That's another day's problem. But what we have done is, you know, the allocation of those really important resources leads to this. It leads to this. And there's another thing I want to give a salute to. It's the highest GPA team I've ever had in my 29 years. And this guy, this guy's 4.75 GPA. All right? So the team, the team is riddled with that scholar athlete, that academic-based athletic dream, it's still alive. And so I just want to thank you, Mayor, and the City Council for supporting them since they were four and five and six on their way here. We need your continued support for that. And we'll keep winning championships. So will Pop Warner. So will T. Uh, Tiana, Tiana Pow Pow is playing for South Carolina. We produce champions, not just on the athletic field, but yes, on the athletic field. So thank you. And this is the first time ever. Yeah. Really yep, it's our first state championship ever. Um, the whole regional thing. <laughs> Northern. Yeah, it's our first one ever, and it's our first undefeated league season ever. These boys did a fantastic job. Our coaching staff is incredible. I'm really proud of them. They all need haircuts, but they're, they're good boys. Well, I do have certificates. How do you want to do that? I think we should read. I'll read them out. All right? Okay, I'll read them out. Yes, if you want to hand them to them. Yeah. Okay. Evan Aldrich, Mr. 4.75. Can I borrow this? I want to get out of their way. Here you go, Mayor. Is this good? Maybe this was yeah. better. All right. Angel Barranco. Hugo Barranco. Our goalkeeper, Mr. Shutout, Jesse Carlos. The, one of the few good haircuts, Santiago Castillo. <laughs> Hassan Diaz. <laughs> Jacob Duclos. <laughs> Sam Jaweski. Isaac Hernandez is playing for our Pirate Baseball team, so he's one that can't be here tonight. But Isaac Hernandez. Yeah, Bar Braulio Ibarra, our League Player of the Year. Wolfred Isaac, our other goalkeeper. Our junior captain, Kellen Love. AJ Martinez, is AJ here? AJ didn't make it either. AJ Martinez. <laughs> Super sophomore, Tristan Martinez. <laughs> Thierry McElroy. <laughs> Ivan Mendez. <laughs> Lincoln Newcomer is back east with his family, so Lincoln Newcomer. Giovanni Ramirez. What's cool about Giovanni is Giovanni's dad was on my first CIF championship in 2002. So that's kind of cool. That's kind of cool. Giovanni Reza. Uvaldo Rodriguez. 
our senior captain, first team all CIF, Mr. Diego Ruiz. <laughs> Standing next to Kellen, our other first team all CIF, but Christian Sanchez, Kiki. <laughs> and of course, Miles Walker. So it takes, it takes a staff to make this dream come true, because these kids obviously had the dream. But that begins, let's see. Shall we do you last, or shall we do you first? Do, do your other, are your other, um, are they here? Okay, then we're gonna do, okay. So, Frank, you have made such a commitment to the city of Oceanside. You have believed in our youth. You have believed in carrying their dream forward, something that it took a long time to do. You, you stepped up, um, you, you created a traveling team, because you said, no, you know what? We, we have the talent. We have the talent and we can help make that um, come true, not just here, but as they move forward in life. So this is, this is the 29th year that Frank Zimmerman has been coaching for OHS. 29th year. And they all say kind of the same thing. Congratulations on your historic win, historic, the first time ever, of the Southern California Regional Championships for Oceanside High School boys soccer. And for you especially, Frank, your 29th year as varsity coach. I applaud your vision, leadership, dedication, commitment, and perseverance, and in being such a positive role model and ambassador for the city of Oceanside. Your efforts have earned you this recognition from Oceanside High School, Oceanside Unified, the city of Oceanside, and the city of Oceanside. This is a special moment for you to share with your family, coaches, students, and friends who are so proud of your accomplishments. Congratulations and best wishes. Thank you guys, you guys rocked. Thank you, thank you. Shall we take a picture, boys? they're going to be coming back, right? So we're going to cheer them on to win the next one, right? Thank you. Okay, closed session report. Thank you, Council Meta 330, to discuss item one on the closed session agenda, conference with labor negotiator involving negotiations with the Oceanside Police Officers Association, non-sworn unit, and the Lifeguards Association. There's no reportable action on that item. Thank you very much. Next are the consent calendar items, items three to 29. Are there any requests from the public to pull? There's a request from the public to pull item number 25. Okay, number 25. Approval of the balance. Okay, there's a motion to approve balance, and there's a second. Please vote. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm pulling number 21. My apologies. I'm pulling number 21. 
as well. And that's really for the good news. <laughs> Motion approved, 5-0. Thank you. Item number 21. is acceptance of Federal Highway Administration Emergency Relief Program funds for Vista Way from El Camino Real to College Boulevard in an amount not to exceed $1.5 million for road damage incurred due to the State Route 78 emergency repair detour. Appropriation of the city share from the Measure X Street Restoration Asphalt Overlay account and authorization for the city engineer to execute and submit all documents and agreements necessary for the use of these funds and for the completion of the project. So Mr. Thomas, our city engineer. Good evening, honorable mayor and city council members. Uh, for item number 21, in 1979, Congress authorized the Federal Highway Administration Emergency Relief Program to aid in the reconstruction of roads which had suffered damage as a result of a declared event or an emergency. As a result of the closure of State Route 78 in March 2023, traffic was diverted onto several city streets, with the predominant street being Vista Way between College Boulevard and El Camino Real. Vista Way was inundated with a majority of east and westbound traffic along 78 for several weeks while Caltrans worked on repairing a failed storm drain. The added traffic rapidly accelerated the deterioration of this portion of the street as commuters sought additional and alternative ways to, commu to continue their daily commute. Um, on March 21st, the city manager declared a local emergency in response to the damage which occurred on May on March 13, 2023. By proclaiming the local emergency, the city became eligible to apply for Cal OES assistance under the California Disaster Assistance Act, as well as applying for funds under the Federal Highway Emergency Relief Program. At that time, the County of San Diego had not been included or added to the Presidential Disaster Declaration, making the city ineligible for FEMA assistance in this event. Um, as a recap, westbound 78 was closed for approximately one month while repairs to the north side of the storm drain were affected. And then the eastbound lanes of 78 were closed for an additional month while the southbound portion of the storm drain was repaired. FHWA will fund 88.53% of the repair, which is estimated to be at $1.7 million this 88.53% represents a $1.56 million share from the federal government. I'm happy to answer any questions at this time. And the city, and the city share, <laughs> didn't mean to say that. Uh, the city's share, say that 10 times, uh, is um, 203,000, correct? And that is, due, that is coming, um, coming from Measure X. So I know I received a lot of complaints about what happened to uh, Vista Way, especially this, this um, part from um, El Camino Real to college. So great, great um, news. When is this gonna start, the construction? Staff is actually working on the preliminary paperwork for FHWA. So as soon as we get the funds, we can move forward with it. Great, I think I heard starting the end of this year. As early as we can. Okay, Absolutely. fantastic. Well, thank you so much. You're welcome. Motion to approve. Is there a second? Second. Uh, any, any comments? Doesn't look like it. Please vote. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Motion approved, 5 0. Thank you. Item number 25 is acceptance of the city treasurer's report for the quarter ended ending uh, December 31st, 2023. And there was someone who pulled it? Yeah, we have item number 25 was pulled by Nadia. Is Nadia here? This is item number 25. City Treasurer's Report. Yes, hi, good evening. Um, this is gonna be quick. I just wanna put a suggestion out there. I'm not sure the proper process, but I'll be learning it. And 
following through. I think the city definitely needs to include in its treasury report um, a breakdown of companies that are profiting off of genocide. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, no other uh, questions or comments. Is there a motion? There's a motion and a second. Please vote. Motion approved, 5 0. Thank you very much. Okay, so let's get to advance request to, to speak, starting with, and that is item number 31, and, the, and beginning with A, Ken Layton. Is he here? Oh. Followed by Anna Maria Hallman, followed by Richard Newton. Five minutes. Mayor Sanchez and Councilman Ken Layton speaking for myself. Uh, loud noises from party people at North Coast Village doesn't seem to be a problem. For years, it's been ground central for out of town party folk. But that uh, doesn't seem, but that's to be expected. You have no expectations of peace and quiet at North Coast Village. They even made a special city zone for this animal house by the sea. Everyone's happy. Not the same in South O. I implore everyone to please watch Monday night's planning commission meeting. Where Excuse you me. Hold on. Please pause. Uh, we're in session. Please close that door so that we can um, continue with our meeting. Thank you so much. Go ahead. Okay. Please watch Monday night's planning commission meeting where you will see many people who bought a home in coastal South Oceanside saying they bought here because the city told them it was zone residential only. They now feel scammed by the invasion of party people brought in to stay a few nights at a time all year long at one of David Fishbach's 77 beachside mini hotels. One woman who complained about late night noise got her tires slashed. Another man who lives next to a Fishbach house said that cigarette and pot smoke and non-stop late night noise forced him to keep his windows shut all night long and install AC. Please note, the people who said enough already are all residents who own their own homes and who vote and who feel scammed by the city of Oceanside. Yes, the visiting hordes do spend money. They go to restaurants, uh, and not all of them are party people. But local homeowners want their neighborhoods back. Oceanside got overrun by Fishbox STR takeover when he figured out that all he had to do was give big campaign cash to Councilman Feller, Kern, and Feline, who made sure Fishbach got everything he wanted. But five years ago, local homeowners started saying enough already. Then, Council Member Esther Sanchez made a motion to put a cap on new short-term rentals. Councilman Weiss and Kime rejected her call to even consider it, to even vote on it. Also in 2019, Mr. Keim attended a meeting in a Fire Mountain home that I also happened to attend, where homeowners were furious, claiming that Mr. Fishbach had lied to them and, and the city to get two single-family homes transformed into high-density businesses whose tenants came and went all year long. At that meeting, Mr. Keim was polite, but he had all the assertiveness of Deputy Barney Fife. Mr. Kime's response was, paraphrasing here, well, we'll keep an eye on it and, and, and we'll have to see what happens. But then, after six years on the council, last December, Mr. Kime all of a sudden saw the light and voted to look at ending all new STRs. What revelation did you have, Mr. Kime, that made you all of a sudden uh, want to become responsive. 
Could it have been a campaign cash windfall of over $20,000 to Mr. Keim or a Keim associated PAC from the McDermott family who has had it with Fishbach and who knows the zoning laws are on his side? But what I wonder, will the McDermott family come to regret their donation if Mr. Keim gets a larger donation from STR sugar daddy David Fishbach and makes Mr. Keim change his mind again? Mayor Sanchez has always been clear on STRs. Can you blame Mr. McDermott? He sees Oceanside as a pay-to-play city. Since Feller, Kern, and Feline launched Oceanside's short-term rental industrial complex, it has spiraled out of control, and Mr. McDermott is simply trying to fight back the Oceanside campaign cash pay-to-play way. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Next is Anna Maria Hallman, followed by Richard Newton. Okay. Good evening, Council. My name is Anna Maria, and I live in District 3. I stand before you again today to implore you to use your power and privilege as our Oceanside Council members to put forth on the agenda a call for a permanent ceasefire in Gaza. My District Council member, Ryan Keim, told me that the situation in Gaza is Mike Levin's concern. Well, who has Levin's ear if not our City Council members? So, demand that Levin call for a permanent ceasefire on our behalf. Keim also told me that the genocide happening in Gaza is not a city concern. With all due respect, of course it is. The truth is, my taxes are arming an occupation that is murdering tens of thousands of innocent indigenous civilians, about half of whom are children. Children like Hind Rajab, a six-year-old girl in Gaza that had recently graduated from kindergarten. She was riding in a car with family, seeking a safer area in Gaza when it was attacked by Israeli gunfire on January 29th. In a nightmarish phone call to the Red Crescent, Hin's 14-year-old cousin can be heard begging for help because a tank is next to them, shooting at them. During this phone call, the cousin is shot and killed. Later, Hin calls the Red Crescent. She said that it was getting dark and that she was afraid of the dark. She said, come and take me. Come and take me. Will you come and take me? Come and take me. Once the Red Crescent finally gets approval, they send two paramedics to rescue him. But for 12 days, no one hears from him, from him or the paramedics. Then on February 9th, the car Hind and her family were in is found destroyed with everyone inside, including Hind, in the beginning stages of decomposition. The ambulance sent to rescue her, blown up just a few feet away, both paramedics killed. Children like 12-year-old Sidra Hasuna, a child in Rafa doing the best she could to maintain happiness by living during a genocide. But on February 12th, while Americans were watching the Super Bowl, Sidra and her family were attacked by Israeli missiles in the so-called designated safe zone of Rafah. <laughs> the missiles hit so severely that their impulse on Sidra's young body Sorry, you guys usually do these like after the kids are gone. <laughs> so, the missiles hit so severely that their impulse on Sidra's young body caused her to be catapulted against a wall where the sleeve of her shirt got caught, causing her lifeless torn body to hang for hours. Both her legs literally sh shredded into bloody ribbons. At least 13,750 children in Gaza have been killed by Israel since October 7th, according to UN Children's Fund spokesperson James Elder. That's not counting the thousands that are uncounted, unaccounted for under the rubble. The international nonprofit Save the Children reported that the number of children killed in the Gaza Strip is the deadliest conflict for children in modern times. That means we have blood on our hands because our tax money pays for this slaughtering of children. A report by the arms research group Cipri found that 69% of all weapons used by Israel are from the United States, and all of the warplanes used against Gaza and Lebanon are made by the United States. 
all except for one single helicopter from France. As our Oceanside representatives, you have a duty to uphold the city of Oceanside's mission statement, which is to enhance the quality of life through outstanding service to its diverse community. For this, I would like the city to put forth a permanent ceasefire resolution and to then divest from contracts with companies that aid and abet the genocide in Gaza. I want our money to stay in our city and support the quality of life of ocean fighters, invest more in education, small businesses, and infrastructure to ensure that another tragedy like the Baltimore Bridge collapse doesn't happen here, since we would be pouring money into our city and out of the war machine. Ooh, I'm like, where do I go? I'm gonna have enough time. All right. Okay, I know it's an election year and you don't wanna rock the boat, but the boat has not only been rocked, it is sinking. You only need to look at the numbers to see how far favorability, favorability with our elected officials like Biden and Levin has fallen. Since I was 18, I have voted as a Democrat. This year, I changed to a third party voter and I am not alone. According to an article in Reuters, some 63% of US adults currently agree with the statement that the Republican and Democratic parties do such a poor job of representing the American people that a third ma major party is needed. So, uh, just yesterday, the UN Special Rapporteur on the Occupied Palestinian Territories released a report titled Anatomy of a Genocide that lists three genocidal acts that Israel has committed in the last five months. I emailed it to all of you if you want to see Thank it. Thank you, Ms. Hallman. Uh, Richard Newton. Mayor Sanchez, members of the council and the public. Uh, speaking about Oceanside's Climate Action Plan, I'd like to build on my previous statements. Uh, in the past two meetings, I first showed that experts can be in air, presenting a list of examples where science and technology got it wrong. I also showed that many scientists are not convinced about man-made climate change theories. I then showed that experts can be swayed by financial incentives, pointing out that experts in court proceedings always make conclusions to the benefit of their paymasters. I also noted how science has changed the definition of a female in a manner that satisfies politicians and NGOs that hold the purse strings to grant funding. I forgot to mention that every transgender patient is worth about a half a million dollars to the medical community, but I'm sure that had no influence on the medical community's changing definition of a woman. For those of us who are not influenced by such concerns, we can see the obvious truth. But this should not be surprising. Economics, that field of study that focuses on human decision-making behavior, makes this prediction. The overarching principle of economics is that people respond to incentives. Specifically, that behavior can be encouraged by giving rewards for doing it. Scientists, doctors, and other experts are people too, after all, and their behavior can therefore be influenced by the economic incentive of government grants. So we can conclude from this that experts are fallible. Of course they are. Once again, they are human. Why does this matter? Because experts are the ones predicting climate change catastrophe. Their predictions are dire and form the core of any political action. But the actions they demand create unimaginably huge burdens on society that involve the transfer of wealth to a favored few. So what burdens does the Climate Action Plan cause the people of Oceanside? Like any law or regulation, government restrictions pose a burden on every individual's freedom and the ability to make the best economic and financial choices for themselves. Of more concern is government creep. Federal income tax, for example, started as only a 1% burden on the wealthiest of Americans. In 2022, President Biden pushed for 1% tax on corporate stock buybacks. Only two years later, he wants to raise that to 4%. This is the norm, and there are many other examples of government costs and burdens growing with time. Narrow new policies let government get its foot in the door. It once open, government then pushes hard against it. This is certain. <clears throat> so a seemingly reasonable rule today can morph into time, morph, morph over time into forcing consumers to eat bugs for protein, or prohibit the use of items such as internal combustion engines or natural gas in our homes. By the way, these are all actual proposals from a much longer list, all in the name of saving the planet. But should huge costs be forced upon society by experts who have frequently been wrong? Unlike the law of gravity, climate theory cannot be empirically tested and proved. It is a mathematical model projected forward in time involving countless variables of unknown sensitivities. In short, it is a mathematical extrapolation of current data using speculation to fill in the blanks. It's worth noting that previous climate models have been discarded as the real world played out and proved their predictions to be inaccurate. Given this, why are governments pushing so hard to adopt climate change measures? That question is political, not scientific. Perhaps the answer is best found from politics and history. At the root of climate change is the consumption of energy. 
Energy is the hidden commodity found in everything, from the clothes we are wearing, to the food we consume, to the cell phones we use. There is no item that does not require energy for its raw materials or manufacturing. Energy is also innately a part of any activity performed. If politicians were looking for an excuse to control behavior, consumption, economic activity, and wealth, then restricting energy use is the most effective way to do that. By controlling energy use, you control absolutely every, as every aspect of human activity. So perhaps the question from history should be, are there examples of tyrants, dictators, or other entities who wish to dominate society, groups of people, or the world? The answer to that is, of course, yes. Simply read any history book. Tellingly, the elites today do not modify their own behaviors to save the planet, but continue to live lavishly. Yes, it seems to be a ploy to control society. If the elites truly believed that the end of the world was otherwise imminent, they would scale back their own activities to save themselves. They are not. Given that climate, activities, uh, climate activists want to redefine how and where we live, what we drive, what we eat, and other freedoms such as travel being limited by government-approved trips, climate alarmism is a godsend for bureaucrats and dictators everywhere. There is no easier way to achieve that goal. It is certainly easier than warfare, which was always used in the past with lesser results. We deserve better than that. Here in Oceanside, please apply any climate plan burdens minimally and extend no further restrictions than mandated by state law. Any commissions formed to study this topic must not be filled with panicked activists, but balanced individuals from both sides of this issue. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, for item number 32, how many um, have signed up? We have 21 speakers under item number 32. Okay, let's go ahead and get started. Two minutes each. Thank okay. you. Our first speaker is D. Keck, to be followed by Hazel Trailer, to be followed by Dave Keck. D. Keck? Pardon? We're on item number 32. Hi, Dee. Good to see you all again, Mayor, to the councilors, our wonderful other officers and representatives of our district, excuse me, of our city. Um, I am here with OSO, Oceanside Speaks Out. I know I'm not new to you. I appreciate your embracing all that we have to say and the width that we will continue to say it. This is having to do with our concerns about the Eddie Jones development that is coming our way, going to be before you in the spring, is what we were told prior. Um, so I don't know the time frame, but we are in spring and we are ready to go. So what I've brought to you tonight <clears throat> is to share with you the, oh, where's my number? Sorry, it's in my bag. The 5,383 signatures that we have so far received by standing in front of supermarkets and standing in various places throughout our community, at churches, anywhere that we would find a group of people who might be willing to listen to us, let us educate them about this development that is coming their way. Too many cars, too big. Those are our two major concerns. It is being proposed under the guise of two conditional use permits. You have the authority to say no thank you based on that alone. The size of the facility is four times what the city code allows, and the number of trucks is five and a half times what the city code allows. So the developer has said, please, conditional use permits, let, it, let us go wild and crazy. They didn't do a tiny little increment saying, can we please have half again as many, twice as many? Oh no, they went big. When we had a meeting long ago with the planning department, my inquiry was when a, a conditional use permit is requested, is there a limit to that? And their answer was no. It is either yes or no. Thank you for your time and your continued support. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hazel Trailer, followed by Dave Keck. Hey, sorry. That did you want to drop off those signatures, okay. Dee? Did you want to drop off those signatures to the city clerk's office? Um, I have, we have already provided this okay. information to the planning department when we put in our 
All right. All right. Thank you very much. Ms. Trailer? I have some pictures to show. I'm really concerned about Oceanside and the blue sky because the sky isn't blue anymore. It's filled up with clouds every day. I see the train, I see the planes flying back and forth, back and forth. I hear them going back and forth. They're spraying our clouds. With what? I have no idea. I know that's illegal. I have pictures. I've taken pictures almost every day. I can show you. I live up on the hill. If I can get this machine to work, I'm not sure. Um, anybody know how to use this? Oh, help me. <laughs> oh, there. I have some I took today on my phone from 8.30 this morning. Same guy was going back and forth, spraying all these things, who knows what. I'd really like to know what's in the spray that they're spraying. He didn't tell me how to use these pictures. Can I put them online? Uh, on that table. What? Just run it across it? Uh, see that table where you have that picture? On the frame. Oh, there it is. what's in it. Maybe you can find out. There's a Clean Air Act. If there's ice in it, if there's whatever they put in there, who knows? I don't know. Some kind of chemicals, who knows? I know that apparently they're saying that all the storms that happened down here were caused by those little sprinkles that they put in the plane. The Santa Ana Water Project, was on uh, online talking all about it. And apparently a lot of people were hurt in San Diego. You know where the flooding was. I just don't want this to be in our ocean. Yesterday, SeaWorld said that the dolphins are becoming extinct. I would never want that to happen. I love dolphins. If I could put some of these on my phone, what happened today, all day long. The sprinkles disappear, and then the guy comes back and forth, does it again. I'm sorry my time Th is up. Thank you very much. Uh, but perhaps the city council could contact CARB or even CWSFR. Th thank you very much. Uh, actually, so that they can you, get you'd be able to do that. Yeah. Um, Mr. Mullen, samples. is there an agency that she could be directed to? I think we'll take her information and look into it. Okay, thank you very much. Next is Dave Keck. Followed by Carol Broland. Followed by Patty Briscoe. Mr. Keck. Oh, good evening, Mayor, uh, City Council members, and other city uh, personnel. Appreciate you being here. I, I would like to bring to your attention how the Eddie Jones Project, if you approve it, will be much more damaging to our seaside community than just increasing traffic to the already congested 76. It will become an environmental justice issue. The California Environmental Protection Agency has developed a tool called Cal Evision Screen. This tool looks at the population census tracts and assigns a pollution burden score that takes into consideration not only the effects of the various pollutants, but also the unique characteristics of the residents residing in each population tract. The map shown here is all the pollution burden scores for all of San Diego County. The more intense orange colored ones are the highest pollution burden is for the uh, population of the people living there. Southern California, excuse me, Southern San Diego County is the greatest accumulation with the exception of the one outlier in the upper left is uh, Oceanside. Go ahead. This map shows the population tracks in Oceanside. 
The blue uh, area is where the Eddie Jones project is going to be, and the two blacked out areas are population uh, tracks that have 71 percentile of the burden of uh, the pollution burden. That results in, they means they are in the 29 percent of the residents who are saddled with the various effects of the pollution that's going to be generated. <clears throat> We already have a high pollution burden, and with the additional stuff of Eddie Jones for the trucks and the traffic and the pollution, it's only gonna go higher and will expose even more of our residents to harmful health bacteria. The only question I have, do we wanna become another Riverside pollution pit? Thank, Thank you very you, much. Sir. Thank you. Carol Broland. Honorable Mayor, City Council members, my name is Carol Broland. I live in the airport community. Um, about a mile away from the proposed Eddie Jones project. I am, uh, I am opposed to this project. I don't think it's a bad project. I think it's a bad location. It would impact our, our traffic, our air quality, our, our road deterioration would increase quickly. Um, traffic would be a nightmare. Air pollution, uh, wildlife, all of, all of these things would be impacted terribly by this project. Um, I'm not here to ask you to, um, to not accept this project. I'm begging you to not accept this project in our community. It will change our life. It will impact our life. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Patty Briscoe. Hi. I'm new to Oceanside, been here about a year, and I'm just here to say I oppose the Eddie Jones project. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you. Uh, Marion Donahue. Yes, um, I'm here to praise a couple of things that are happening in Oceanside. I would like to commend Valerie McAdam and her crews who helped me during the flooding. She embodies the spirit of Oceanside helping people. I also would like to commend the buying of the uh, two acre, I think it's two acre parcel, where the battery storage facility will be Fine. built. That is in line with our climate control um, and our climate goals for the city of Oceanside. All of you received a handwritten letter with photographs about my fire concerns about Eddie Jones and having lived through the Panorama Fire in San Bernardino, I do not wish to see any single tiny spark ignite the whole hillside like happened to me once before in my life. I would like to think that we in Oceanside are putting people before money. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Nathan, followed by Macy, followed by Madison Lang. Well, actually, well, let's try to do those three. <clears throat> Hello, Council, Mayor, and Deputy Mayor. Another couple weeks have come and gone, and there has been little done for those suffering in Gaza besides putting forward words without any concrete action. What we have had is the recent UN uh, Security Council resolution calling for a ceasefire in Gaza. However, Israel continues to escalate its ongoing aggression and its genocidal siege of Gaza. Israel has shown and continues to show us that international law is but mere empty words. This has been the case for the past 76 plus years that Zionism has been violently dispossessing Palestinians, Lebanese, and Syrians from their lands. I recently saw the post made by Councilman Joyce, and while I applaud this urgent call for a ceasefire, I don't agree with this framing of both sides being on equal footing. No one would dare suggest that both sides were equal during apartheid in South Africa, during the genocide of native peoples across North and South America, Australia, Africa and other settler colonial states, or during the Holocaust of Jews, Roma, and others, others persecuted during World War II. If you cannot identify the root of the problem, you will forever be sing slinging empty words at the issue while things get worse. If we cannot identify that the violence of colonialism, the indignity of imperialism, and the dishonesty of supremacy are the roots of the Zionist aggression in occupied Palestine, then we will continue to see things unfold as they are right now. Uh, I call on this council to declare a, 
put forth a resolution for an imme a permanent ceasefire, and I hope you all find the humanity and courage to do the right thing. Thank you. Thank you, Macy, followed by um, Madison Lang. And then we'll have to take up our six o'clock item. Honorable Mayor and City Council, there will come a day, maybe in two years, maybe in 10, maybe in 20, where we will look at what is happening in Gaza right now and realize as a collective bipartisan whole that our role in this was unacceptable. Much like 20 years on from the invasion of Iraq, we can look across party aisles and see disgust. Disgust for Abu Ghraib. Disgust for the shock and awe campaigns. Disgust for torture disguised as interrogation techniques that led to no answers. And disgust for presidents who lied to 335 million Americans about the necessity of war. You may not realize it, but my generation has seen endless war. <laughs> Weapons of mass destruction and 40 beheaded babies are warmongering lies directly from our past and current president's mouths that led to thousands of civilian deaths in Iraq and Gaza, respectively. We murdered so many civilians in Iraq that it's still debated by the thousands 20 years later. What I'm saying is that there will come a time when the history books point to everyone in power who ignored their direct or indirect role in enabling this genocide. You may not see yourself in those books, and I'm sorry you feel so powerless. Still, your position of power could be used to put Oceanside on the map alongside the cities of Pasadena, Santa Ana, Lemon Grove, which is just a 45-minute drive south from us, and many others across the state and our country that passed ceasefire resolutions calling for an end to this nightmare that we are all being forced to not only watch, but to fund with our hard-earned money as well. Please, Esther, we have been begging you to put forward a motion. We don't want to work against the first woman elected mayor in Oceanside, but you are leaving us no choice by ignoring our pleas. Do the right thing. Talk with Eric, who posted today calling for an end to the violence on his Instagram. You have the power to put this on the agenda, and as we have been begging you to do for the last four months. Reach across the aisle and speak with your fellow council members. Do your duty in the absolute bare minimum of having this conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Madison Lang. This is the first time I've done this, but I pushed the Just push the mic in front of you, towards you, the mic. Oh, okay. Yes, all the way. To, yes, and sp speak as close as you can to it. Is this so. it? Okay. There um, you go. Honorable Mayor and Council Members, I enjoy every day that I get to drive to and from my house. For example, um, they're going to be building the um, ocean camp, and there might be 9,000 vehicles a day. They're expecting a three room, 300 room hotel, trailer park where Am Airstream trailers will get to park, and there'll be condos to rent. Then I get to turn right for about a mile and a half, and suddenly I'll get to Airport Drive, which is also the other side of Benet, and you want to build a 114 bay truck warehouse with each of those trucks carry 500 gallons of gas. Now, you know already the 76 is a zoo. I hope all of you are familiar with the 76 mm -hmm. because it's only two lanes on each side. We can't have 9,000 cars coming to the ocean camp and then 114 bay trucks every 24-7 driving on that road. If there's a fire, we're all going to die in the middle of the street. So please, please, please think about this before you approve this warehouse because it's insane. <laughs> Thank you very much. All right, it is 6 o'clock. We're going to go ahead and get started on our one public hearing item. This is item number 30. Um, we'll go back to um, the items, uh, public comments on um, not on the agenda after we finish our public hearing item. Um, item 30 is receipt of a report on the anticipated fiscal year 2024-2025 housing and urban development program budget for the community development block grant and Home Investment Partnership Programs. Allocating funding for various housing and community development activities, planning, and program administration to be included in the fiscal year 2024-2025 annual action plan. Uh, conduction of a public hearing on the prioritization of the grant funds and development of the 2024-25 annual action plan and closing of the public hearing and initiation of the 30-day comment period. So we are going to um, open up the public hearing and I'll go ahead and do that. Uh, request disclosures uh, from council members regarding constituent contacts and correspondence. Staff only. 
Staff. Members of the public. Uh, staff and community is concerned. Uh, Mr. Navarro, do we have um, any correspondence and or petitions? We haven't received any correspondence or petition on this item. Okay. So we are going to uh, hear from Cecilia Barandiaran, management analyst for the City of Oceanside. Um, after she does her uh, presentation, we will hear from the public. You did not um, have to sign up to be able to uh, um, speak on this. Um, we will then close the public hearing. Um, we will go to the council for questions and our comments. Uh, we will then state that the report is hereby received. We do not need a motion for that. And therefore, thereafter, we will, this begins the 30-day comment period. So, Ms. Barandiaran. Good evening, Mayor Sanchez, City Council members. I am here tonight to report on the anticipated 2024-25 funding priorities for various housing and community development uh, needs. Receive additional input and start a 30-day mandated comment period. The action plan is part of the adopted 2020-25 consolidated plan that identifies the anticipated uses of our CDBG and home dollars, and it was based on the community input received from various community groups such as Crown Heights, Eastside, Libby Lake, and Tri-City neighborhoods. And it shaped the proposed uses of the 2020-25 consolidated plan. The primary objective of the CDBG program is the development of viable communities through decent housing, suitable living environment, and expanded environment economic opportunities for low and moderate income persons. Additional federal requirements include the nature of the activity, meeting national objectives, organizational capacity, and adequate administrative and financial systems. Entitlement figures are based on the current fiscal year 23-24 fiscal allocations. HUD has not yet published the anticipated 24-25 allocations. CDBG program income consists of repaid loans and any unexpended funds from prior years. We are anticipating a cut to our CDBG entitlement of approximately 10%, and all programs and activities will be further reduced based on the actual HUD appropriation. In terms of administration and planning, funds under this category cover all city staff associated with the management and administration of, of C, the CDBG program, including regulatory compliance, contract administration, subrecipient monitoring, fiscal management, and prepared of all the required planning documents. The administration and planning category also includes housing program development activities to promote fair housing. Per HUD regulations, administration and planning activities are capped at 20% of the annual entitlement, and it's currently 278,337. Public services, we are allowed to spend 15% for public services of our allocation, and that amount is 208,753. After the public services administration activities are funded, remaining funds may be used for eligible capital improvement projects, public facility improvements, other housing community development related activities. As it relates to our Section 108 loan repayment, we continue to make payments on, the annual, on an annual basis for its Section 108 loan for the construction of Fire Station 7. Payments on this loan began in 2008-2009 and are amortized over the 20 years with um, our allocation being 257,546 for next year. The total balance remaining on our 108 loan is $1,066,441.53 and will be fully repaid in fiscal year 28-29. The Housing and Neighborhood Services Department also manages our housing rehabilitation programs, including loans to low-income homeowners and grants to very low-income mobile homeowners. Existing housing programs are funded with prior year dollars, with a combined allocation of 430,000. This budget includes 130 for project management and loan services, the rest is direct to clients. In regards to public facilities, several capital projects have been identified with the assistance of community input, again received through the Parks and Recreation Master Plan, the Eastside, Crown Heights, Tri-City, and Libby Lake neighborhood communities. Staff prioritize these projects over the consolidated plan five-year cycle, and we are entering in our last year of that five-year cycle. Our home program um, income consists of repaid and or unexpended funds from prior years. Home program income consists of repaid, again, unexpended funds from prior years. Sorry to be duplicative. Hmm. The home program admin budget is capped at 10%, and the amount set aside for qualified community housing development organizations known as CHOTOs is capped at 15%. 
The other allocation is to continue to support the tenant-based rental assistance program for the community. Since this is the final year of the five-year consolidated plan, staff went to existing meetings and listened to community needs. The Libby Lake meeting had 21 attendees and the Crown Heights had 12 residents. All the comments received at these meetings have been added to the attachment C. This concludes staff's presentation. Um, I'm available for questions, thank you. Thank you, I, I did want to ask a question um, since just there. Why wasn't the East Side neighborhood included in the community meetings? Part of the community meeting process is over the whole five year cycle. And over that five year, we have gotten input from all the different communities and that's part of our general plan. Are you saying that it's because it was done last year and didn't have to be done this year? We tend what? to try to hit different neighborhoods every year, so we're not hitting the same community every year. Right. Okay. Thank you. Um, this is a public hearing. This is a time for the public to um, give us uh, your input on this, on the CDBG, that's community um, development. Oh, yes. Uh, Councilmember Joyce also has a question before we get to the public. I just wanted to ask um, why uh, specific neighborhoods are, are picked for the community meetings? Are they uh, for any particular reason? Council member, um, I mean, Mayor Sanchez, Council member Joyce, city council members, when we look at our community outreach, we tend to see in January and February what events are happening. What did we attend the prior year? Um, where are we in the cycle? Are we towards the beginning of the cycle, towards the end of the cycle? And so as part of that process, we determine which events we're going to go to. As, of, as we're at the end of our five-year cycle, we wanted to more to get the community input uh, in terms of what we've heard over the last five years and address really what we have already done. So we, lo we looked at this year's cycle as kind of out outlining what we did in your communities. Um, we didn't hit all of them. We only just hit two, but it was really what was happening in those communities at that time. You know, that's actually, actually not a very acceptable response because this is really based on census tracts um, and the income uh, in within those census tracts, and you probably should be doing that every so year is what I, I would recommend. I was just going to clarify my question. Yeah. It was just that our particular neighborhoods that uh, are designated with low and low to moderate income, those are the neighborhoods that, we tip, that we're serving with these funds, right? The programs are available, um, generally, some of them are available citywide. Some are targeted to certain community neighborhoods that are um, reach those low mod definitions. For example, the rehab program is available citywide. The applicant who has to be qualified, okay, not the neighborhood. Okay. So it goes both ways. Th thank you. That's what I was asking. All right, this is a public hearing. Uh, if you wish to speak, do we have anyone that has um, actually signed up to speak? We have four speakers that have registered to speak. Okay, we'll item. go ahead and get to those speakers and then um, I'll ask again if anyone else wishes to speak on this item. You wanna call the, the Our names? Our first speaker is Adriana Fortado to be followed by Max Disposti. Hello, council, mayor and deputy mayor. Thank you for allowing me to speak today. My name is Adriana Furtado, and I have lived in the city of Oceanside for over 20 years, and I was lucky enough to purchase a home here in 2008. We love it here. My husband is an Army veteran, and both of our children have attended Oceanside schools since elementary, and my daughter recently got her associate's degree from Miracosta College, so we love Oceanside. I'm actually here on behalf of an organization that I work for, that I currently work for, and the individuals that we serve. I'm the Resource Development Director for Operation Hope North County. We are a shelter that serves families with children and single women who are experiencing homelessness while they rebuild their lives and regain independence. Last year, fiscal 22-23, we served 169 individuals, with 109 of them being children. We had a 66% success rate of individuals transitioning to housing 55% moved to stable housing, while an 11% moved to a continuum of care. 19, excuse me, 19 percent of those individuals were from the city of Oceanside, second highest only to the city of Escondido, which was at 20 percent. We also serve over 100 families weekly through our food pantry and boutique, 
a free service we offer to the local community not residing in the shelter, including the city of Oceanside. We belong to the ARS Shelter Network as a community partner with agencies doing similar work to ours. We also house individuals exiting from the Oceanside Navigation Center when we have availability. We are a high barrier shelter, which means that our funding from government sources is very limited, but our success rate shows that this model works. Individuals suffering from homelessness do not have a one size fit all need and all models need funding. I understand that CDBG funds are usually reserved for specific areas within a specific city, but I'm here to ask that you consider broadening your scope to fund other areas, allowing for funds to be spread more evenly across the county, or at the very least, allowing outside agencies who serve residents within your city. We can apply for this and then wait for your decision. I think that would be prudent of you. Thank you. Thank you, Max Disposti, and um, you, you can actually have a seat if you want. <laughs> yeah. Cecilia. Hello, good evening, Max Disposti, resident of Oceanside, also community, um, community resource center, um, there you go, community relations commission <laughs> chair and city commissioner. Thank you, good evening. I, I just wanted to address some of my concerns. First of all, what I wanted to put to the record that the CRC will meet next Tuesday, April 2nd at 6 p.m., and we would like to bring this, uh, we're bringing this as an agenda item, so to give more opportunity to the public to ask questions. Perhaps I will consult to the staff, I haven't done so, to see if anyone from the department will be available to come for any questions that the public might have, besides what's happening here. That's one thing. The second thing, I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit concerned about, and even though I'm pretty much familiar with CDBG funding, I know how they work, what's left, what's not left, but there's a lot of things I think to the public are given for granted. That sometimes it's hard to wrap our mind around it. For instance, we know that many years ago, previous council made the decision, the decision that most, not all of the funds, most of the funds needs to go to CD RAM project. Perhaps that's a decision that might have to be revisited if we agree to it. Because like the previous speaker was saying, sometimes we have uh, organizations, old dynamics or new coming up issues in the city that need to be addressed. After all, it's community uh, CDBG grants up, apply for neighborhood that I need and they match the map of underserved community. The second thing, so I'm a little bit concerned about that. So I wonder if the, in this 30 days revision, the council could, that is more of a question, look into revisiting that decision of years ago and perhaps update it in one way or another, see if there is another way to distribute funds because at this point it looks like we have public input, but in reality we already know the money is being allocated, not because there is anything fishy about it, I'm not making that assumption, it's just that we have loans to pay, right, from previous decisions done tw almost 20 years ago. We have things that they are due, and of course at the end of it we're all fighting over $200,000, which I don't want to compete with Crown Heights when I fight for my own nonprofit organization that needs to be here, provide services to people that I need. And I feel really this is what's happening, that we are all jumping into whatever is left over. So I hope we can create a different system. And in this case, I, space, I, I speak on my hat as a North County LGBT Resource Center because we're just purchasing a property in 1919. Apple Street, we're in escrow right now, we're moving forward, cost $4.5 million with our own money, just for the record. Uh, actually, the county is stepping in, perhaps other cities in, in, in the in county are helping to the purchase because we have proven to serve North San Diego County, but I will speak to you about that. But I would like to invite the council to have a conversation that opens up the opportunity of not getting stuck with what has been decided by the council 10 years ago and try to be more creative about how can we really make an impact in the city with a different way, perhaps even next year, to, uh, to adopt this funding. And thank, thank you for your you. time. Thank you. Sana E. Hi, council members. This I'm is here. to speak on, on the CDBG block grant program. I gotta go. I have something really fast to say, yeah, I'm and sorry. I'm gonna go. This is a public Please hearing. Please call for a ceasefire. I'm sorry. Ceasefire. If you have any okay. shame, call Let's just for take a, a break. ceasefire. Let's take okay. a break. Thank you, Ms. Palmer. Am I am I on? Yes. Okay. Thank you, Mayor, uh, Council Members, Deputy Mayor, 
thank you for opening this space for us to share. Um, today I'm coming to you as in two of my roles. Um, I live in Oceanside. I've lived here for close to 50 years. My kids were raised here. My husband's a veteran. And um, I also experienced uh, housing insecurity. By the time I reached high school, I had moved at least 25 times. At the time, there weren't very many uh, resources. And we are living in a time where there are starting to be uh, resources available. And as homelessness and housing insecurity continues to rise, especially among families with children, we're seeing uh, a, an absolute growth of families experiencing homelessness. I'm really fortunate to be a board president for Operation Hope North County that's been in existence for 20 years. I'm also really blessed and fortunate to be part of a city that really invests in programs like Operation Hope. So I first want to thank you for the continued partnership with Operation Hope North County. Um, as you heard some of the data from Audrey uh, Furtado, I won't repeat it, but I will remind you that 19% of the families that we serve come from Oceanside. Additionally, I know that you currently give to the ARS, but as more programs are opening up through the ARS, that means the monies that you put into there become even more diluted or more stretched. And cities are starting to pull out. And I wanna just beg you to please continue to support programs like Operation Hope. Our data is showing that we need multiple models and you're supporting Operation Hope. That's one of the models of many others. And we're also you know, connecting with the Navigation Center. We're taking families from there. We're providing uh, care after they exit through the food pantry and the boutique. And that's also supporting our Oceanside residents. So again, as you reconsider or start thinking about the proposals, I also ask that you think about putting extra money for Operation Hope North County. I also want to recognize that I had my thoughts all together, but because of the incident that happened, it, it's really hard to refocus. And I apologize if it's coming out a little scattered. I also got a little emotional. So thank you for coming. Thank you for creating this space. And again, I ask you to reconsider and add uh, funds for Operation Hope North County on behalf of the families with children and the single women that we continue to serve as part of your vision for Oceanside. Gracias. Thank you very much. Okay, that is the end of the list. Okay, this is a public hearing. You do not have to have signed up to speak on this specific item. This is by law. This item has been calendared for six o'clock. This is the only thing that we can hear at this time. We will resume on items not on the agenda after we complete this public hearing item, which is item number 30. Is there anyone else that wishes to address the CDBG program? I see no one rising, so I'm gonna go ahead and close uh, this part of the hearing. This is uh, closing the public hearing and go to the council for comments and questions. Okay, we don't have any, Council Member Joyce. So I just wanna bring up a couple comments on um, the current plan. So I just think it's really important to hear the, the objective. So I'm just gonna read it and apologize for uh, any belabor this. But the primary objective of CDBG program is the development of viable urban communities, principally low and moderate income persons through decent housing, a suitable living environment, and expanded economic opportunity. Um, so uh, I brought this up uh, last year and I just wanna ping it again. We're currently paying down uh, over $200,000 on uh, a loan to pay off uh, Fire Station 7, is that right? Fire, Fire Station, Station 7? 7, yes. Okay, and so for me, it, it seems very clear that even though this is a a legal, I, I, I uh, asked legally, is this something that we can do? And it's, it's been approved, yes, it's legal. It seems very clear to me that this is not within the intent of the CDBG program. The program itself is really a, just a slice of our budget. 
that is supposed to really be investing in communities that haven't been invested in in a long, long time. That's the purpose. I mean, it's the designated purpose that we're given by it. And so even though that this is a, a something that we can do, I don't think it's something that we should do. And so I, again, will kind of ask my colleagues for thoughts, ideas. Um, I know that they, they actually go into communities that are in several different districts. Uh, Council Member Robinson, uh, the Libby Lake community, which is getting some investment this year, uh, could certainly benefit from the 200 plus thousand dollars that are being paid out for that loan. Uh, likewise, uh, Council Member Kime, the Tri-City community could use investments. We know that there are lots of needs within that park area, uh, making it safer for the residents to, to be there, to, to enjoy the amenities that other uh, areas of our city have traditionally enjoyed that make them a well a well-being place for people to thrive. So my ask would be that we take uh, part of what we're rolling over from this year's budget, because I know last year it ended up as like, where do we take it from? Well, this year we're projected to have about 700 and plus thousand dollars rolled over from the budget. I suggest that we take the exact amount that it would take to pay this loan's payment next year and put that in a separate account to pay this loan next year. That way we free up these funds to actually be used for the purposes that they're supposed to be used for. So I just ask if there's any support for that from my colleagues. I, I like to have the conversations up here. I know it's kind of weird because we talk one at a time and they kind of wait, but it, I just, are there any thoughts or comments from my colleagues? Okay, I don't see any other lights yet. Oh, Council Member Weiss. I don't know, does, do you know what the outstanding balance is on the loan? I think it was 1.3, no, what is it, let's see. Hang on one second, it took my notes. It's over, a little over a million. Okay, and, and you said it was, it's, it's, it's due to one, be paid it, off? Uh, Council, Council Member Weiss, it's 1.25 million. And it paid off in when, 2028? 20, 28, 29. 28, 29, okay, thank you. My only concern is if you take the 747,000, it's already rolled into the budget. So the, the budget that they're proposing already includes that um, unallocated money. I meant from our the 700,000 from our general funds that's that's, oh, that's being okay. left over. And, and I wasn't taking the whole thing, take the 200 plus thousand that it takes to make this payment. Council Member Robinson? Oh, I'm sorry. Councilmember Weiss, did you have another comment? Councilmember Robinson? Thanks. Um, I just don't have really enough time or information. I'm just wondering, is this something that at our budget workshop that we can talk about? Is that appropriate or does it have to be decided tonight? It doesn't have to be decided tonight. This is the beginning of the 30 days, so this is going to actually come back to us, um, not as a public hearing item, but you know, we will hear from the public again. Um, and we will be able to, to actually make a decision at that point. We're not making decisions tonight. And we could check with uh, Cecilia, but I believe they have to submit their budget May 15th. So we would have to, is that correct to, to HUD? Correct, we come back to you, I believe it's on May 3rd as a consent action item for the approval of the plan, um, unless we're directed to change any of the proposed projects and we submit the plan by May 15th and that is federal statute. Yeah, it, could, it doesn't have to be consent. It could be a, a general item as well. Correct. Right. Um, the other thing that we, I would like us to consider is if we were to, uh, uh, we did this for the bridge when we were paying that down. We advanced, we just went ahead and paid it off. Um, and we had some savings because of, you know, whatever interest that was left, we were able to, to pay that down. So I'd like to uh, see us look at that. And back in the day when this was um, actually arranged, we didn't have Measure X. It would have been a perfect project for Measure X. So now that we do have Measure X, I'd like to see um, the possibilities of Measure X taking on the balance of the, the debt. Because CDBG is much more limited in terms of its scope than, say, 
Measure X um, in terms of public safety. Uh, that public safety is one of the more critical things that Measure X addresses. Um, and it's, in fact, is being used for, um, to build Fire Station 1. So I would like staff to look at that and bring that, bring that information back to us when, when we see this again. Any other comments? We're taking comments now from all council members. Council Member Weiss. I would say that I'm comfortable with the program outline that staff has provided us to not start wholesale changing things now, but I like the idea of, in, in advance of this coming back to us, next, I don't mean this time, next year, that we address these issues, because I think they are valid issues, to see do we have a plan that we could um, replace the either the loan payment or some other way of paying off, whether it's Measure X or some other uh, idea, but to, to infuse an additional 257,000 in the CDBG program, I think you'll have other, you'll have plenty of opportunity to spend that money. So I, I would support the effort to come back, have staff come back in advance of us going through all of this again next year. Right, because if you, at the end of the, uh, of the staff report, there is uh, some comments that were made. And I, I know that lights at some of the various um, parks in the at-risk neighborhoods, lighting is very critical. It's, it, it, in fact, it's also a public safety issue too. Um, but it is critical to those communities. Um, and uh, it's been on the uh, list for, I'm sure, over a decade. Um, probably even two decades. Um, so there are a lot of wants and desires. Um, so yes, we, we, those are the things that we could at least start to also look at. Any other comments? Council Member Joyce. So just to clarify, are we, gonna, are we gonna get back information about either paying it off and or other options for going with at the end of this 30 day period? I just don't wanna leave here with the question wide open. Um, because I think they need more information to make sure that they're going forward in the right direction. Uh, Mayor Sanchez, Council Member Joyce, members of the council, uh, from the city manager's office perspective, we can come back with what alternatives to making those payments, what other sources are available to you for that, and then you can weigh that. I would encourage you to weigh that in the context of other budget requests. Um, but yes, we can come back with what are the options? What what balances are available to pay those to pay that um, pay to pay off the balance of that loan? Are we able to do that in enough time to give the feedback to the housing department so that they can be ready on May fifteenth? Well, the budget workshop is before okay. this comes back in May third. Yes, right. And I think the comments that were made by Councilmember Weiss um, reflect that we have already. Um, allocated the Measure X funds for this fiscal year, right? For the for fiscal year 23-24, yeah, there isn't an opportunity to right. allocate those, but for fiscal year 24-25, we still are, need to go to the Measure X Citizens Oversight Committee and okay. to your council for the workshop. All right, great. Thank you. Any other comments? Nope. All right, so... Um, we hereby receive the report and uh, we now begin the 30 day comment period. And we will be back um, on, what day was that, May? May 3rd. May 3rd, on the regular um, council, either on consent or on the regular, which, so um, it'll be at the five o'clock, not at six o'clock. Six o'clock was for this to begin the public hearing on this matter. All right, thank you. Thank you, Mayor, Council Members. Thank you very much. Okay, we're gonna go back to uh, comments not regarding items not on the agenda, and we had left off with Madison Lang, I believe, so we're now at Mary Hansen, followed by Randy Hansen, followed by Michelle D.C. Mertzi. Good evening, I'm Mayor Sanchez and Council. Um, I just, I'm Mary Hansen, and I've lived here in Oceanside for 20 years. And I wanted to let, let you know that I oppose the Eddie Jones project. 
I um, really wish that it could be rezoned, rezoned even. It's just not a good fit for our city and with the Ocean Camp Park. Um, I would love, um, even the coach that was here from the soccer said we need fields. And I don't know, I know that doesn't bring in a lot of revenue, but I have, my husband can talk about being a volleyball uh, coach and been here and doing the team things. Um, that even if we were to get like a sports club and you know you could get revenue through that. So that's one idea that I have or something that people could go down the, the bike path um, fr from the hotel or whatnot and stop at that we had like little, I don't know what, things that they sold stuff. But um, main concerns, traffic. It's not only backing up our neighborhood, but the 76 and the five will be a nightmare. Somebody even talked about um, the safety with the fires, and we had two of them. Um, very scary situation. We only have one way in, one way out. With Ocean Camp, that's gonna block up that side. Noise, um, we already have a lot from the airport and traffic noise where we live, and it comes up into the valley where we're at. So those are my concerns, and um, just wanted to let you know. Thank you. Thank you very much. And Mr. Hansen? Randy? Hello, Honorable Mayor and City Council. Thank you for your service. I oppose the uh, Eddie Jones also, and I do bank, back up Frank, the coach. Uh, it would be great to see a sports park there, something that could add some value to these kids. Um, the other thing, I was sitting at the 76 in Bennett, and this just really caught me by surprise, but there were two 18-wheelers in front of me. It took me two lights to get through that Bennett signal. This project has 112 bays for trucks, 18-wheelers. I don't know how we're gonna handle that in our city, in our, in our 76, already being the nightmare that it is with all the accidents. The first responders, thank you for their service. There's accidents on that. Street, we hear them almost every day. So, again, I'd oppose uh, Eddie Jones, and I want to thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Michelle Lisi, Lisi Mercy. Honorable Mayor, Council Members, today is the eve of my final cancer treat. Woo! After one year of trials and tribulations, the support of my family and friends will never be forgotten. The appreciation of the love and support will always be appreciated. Which brings me to the topic of today, freedom for Palestinians. Please, please take a moment and put yourself in Palestine. We've all seen the pictures and heard the lies. Can you imagine your history, your family, and your future being systematically erased while you are moved around like cattle and even referred to as animals. Stop the genocide. Stop the support financially of Oceanside's money. Free, free Palestine. Thank you. Pat Hartley, followed by Nadia. Thank you, Honorable Mayor and City Council. These are my own judgments um, alone. <clears throat> my purpose here is to bring people together in the name of hopes of just stopping the killing. But it's hard, you know? As I sit here, and I don't know what happened while some of our speakers were talking, but I saw Mr. Robinson, Mr. Weiss, smiling, laughing, and I'm curious. What was so funny? What was the punchline? Maybe you could even look at us and acknowledge us. I think I know what the punchline is. Could you address your comments to all of us, please, sir? I think I know what the punchline is here. We are, right? We're, we're standing up for human rights, and what do you do? You laugh, you snicker. And another thing, 
I'll tell you what the, what the joke is. The joke is we're standing around, what does it say, liberty. We, we, we pledge the flag, liberty and justice for all. Those are great words. Okay? What happens when we walk outside those doors? What's the reality? Is the reality liberty and justice for all? Because just a few weeks ago, I can tell you, we were just a peaceful rally, a caravan. We're just driving down, down Coast Highway, and some guy runs out and yells, terrorist. And then on top of that, he walks back to his front door, closes his door, and yells, white power. But what is that? Not only is he Islamophobic, he's anti-Semitic. Thank you, sir. I'll just end with one thing. Eli Weissel, a Nobel Prize winner and Holocaust survivor, he said, I swore to never be silent. Whenever and wherever human beings endure suffering and humiliation, we must always take sides. Neutrality helps the oppressor, not the oppressed. Silence encourages the tormentor, never the tormented. Thank you very much. Please don't be silent. Nadia, followed by Ali Elfara. Good evening, Mayor, City Council. I know you guys missed me the last couple of meetings, but I promise I've been watching um, and been very active. I'd like to say I found it super interesting to watch the public comments last time, uh, especially the vigor in defending and dispelling the truth when it came to vaccines. Trust me, I believe in science, so I totally believe in dispelling those lies. But then we sat and watched two Zientologists talk for two minutes straight, that's four minutes, doing nothing but lying, and no one spoke up to say, oh, that's not true, we just let them talk. So I feel like we should have the same respect for uh, the truth and facts. But that being said, certain council members, I understand, don't believe in international law. They actually misquote it, just like our representative Mike Levin, which is very sad as an attorney that he <laughs> can't follow laws, I guess, um, and just feels Israeli propaganda talking points. Um, for one of the other council members, I know you spoke to one of us before and you said, why would I speak about this genocide when there's others going on? As an attorney, I would never, ever ask a question that I do not know the answer to. And it's a mistake that you made that question because if you look into it, Israel is the key, or not the key, but one of the key main important factors in these genocides. For Rwanda in 94, then 70% of the arms to Azerbaijan and the um, Artsakh Armenian genocide or ethnic cleansing, depending on what you want to classify that as, et cetera, et cetera. As we honored the soccer players today, I remind myself that I grew up here playing soccer on the beach by the pier with my brother. We started when I was nine and he was 11. In 2014, Israel directly targeted four Palestinians playing soccer on the beach. That could have been me, that could have been my brother, could have been any of these kids we honored today. But we still sit here in silence. So I'm please asking you to do this one easy thing, put on the agenda to call for immediate permanent ceasefire. Thank, Thank you, you, Nadia. Ali Alfara. Followed by Christina. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen of the Oceanside City Council. My name is Ali Al-Fara, and I stand before you today as a young Palestinian American um, whose heart is heavy with loss. In the past six months, the ongoing genocide in Palestine has taken more than 150 members of my family. And those from my family that are alive are currently trying to make ends meet as they have lost their homes and been displaced multiple times, all while trying to look for something to eat for the day. Three of those who passed away were my uncles and many of which were my cousin, which has caused my parents to suffer deep loss and mourning. These aren't just numbers. They were fathers, mothers, and children, lives full of dreams and aspirations like anyone else in this room. I'm here today to not only represent my family and the innocent Palestinian people, but to represent the entire global population. Because if we aren't willing to stand up for humanity now, what makes us think that we are willing to stand up for humanity in the future? 
Growing up in Oceanside, I learned to cherish the values of community, empathy, and peace. Our city, known for its beautiful harmony and diverse cultures, has always been a beacon of hope and understanding. Today, I urge you to extend that spirit of peace beyond our shores. The resolution for a ceasefire is not just a political statement, it's a moral imperative, a call for humanity to prevail over conflict. By passing this resolution, Oceanside will send a powerful message that we stand for peace, that we empathize with the suffering of all families affected by this conflict, regardless of their origin. This isn't about taking sides. It's about recognizing the sanctity of human life. Every day, this genocide continues. More innocent lives are lost. We have the opportunity to be a voice for those who can't speak, to advocate for the cessation of violence, and to support diplomatic efforts that aim for lasting peace. I implore you to consider the impact that this resolution would have. It's a step towards healing, towards showing the world that in Oceanside, we don't just dream of a better, more peaceful world. Thank you. We act to make it a reality. Thank you. Thank you for Christina, time. followed by Elizabeth. Christina, followed by Elizabeth, followed by Max, Maxi. It seems like you think showing your support for a permanent ceasefire is meaningless, irrelevant, or offensive, but it's quite the opposite, and you shouldn't be afraid of that. We need to start making these big statements loud and proud. Everyone needs to know what Israel is doing to those innocent people in Palestine is unacceptable and will not be condoned any longer. Are you really willing to sit there and watch an entire population diminish in front of your eyes real time? Please do not tell me you're fine with the continuous murder of more black and brown lives. To me, it spoke a lot about your character, Mayor Sanchez, how you reacted to a random woman making dumb accusations and saying nothing important about your vaccinations. What's it going to take for you to get that concerned and worked up over grown adults aiming missiles at minors? We talk about extracurriculars for our youth like junior lifeguards. What about the youth in Gaza who have to spend all day searching for something to eat or drink? You want little brown kids in Vista to have a chance at becoming a junior lifeguard? What about the brown kids in Palestine who lost that opportunity when their arm, leg, or ear have been blown off? At the end of the last meeting, city council member Eric Joyce was courteous enough to speak with me after I expressed my distress on the topic and the lack of the council not addressing it at all. After trying to convince him how dire and important this is, he did offer to support putting the topic on the agenda. We were not able to secure that offer in writing, and I do not have my witness with me right now, though I really hope his offer still stands. And I really hope that inspires one of you other council members to also support this very urgent and important topic. Please stop letting history repeat itself. Please stop killing my people. A resolution for a permanent ceasefire and allowing all aid to enter Palestine is what we demand, and you should too. Thank you. Elizabeth C., followed by Maxi e. S. Thank you. Honorable Mayor Sanchez, esteemed members of the City Council, my name is Elizabeth C., and I'm a resident and former business owner here in Oceanside. I'd like to remind everybody that there was a ceasefire on October 6th. I stand here today to request that you please do not engage with the calls for a ceasefire resolution in relation to the Israel-Hamas war. Please do not allow this item to ever be on a city council agenda here in Oceanside. There are three reasons why I make this request. The first one is the war in the Middle East is an international affair. It is not a local matter. There are plenty of local issues here in Oceanside to contend with. Number two, a ceasefire could easily be achieved today if Hamas would release the 134 remaining uh, hostages. Me. Hold, hold, hold on. Excuse me. The First Amendment freedom of speech belongs to each one of us. We've been respectful towards everyone else. Please be respectful to the person now speaking. Thank you. Go ahead. A ceasefire could easily be achieved if Hamas would release the 134 remaining hostages, women, men, children, and babies, 
who still remain underground in tunnels having been kidnapped on October 7th, 172 days ago. Return the people, lay down the weapons, the war is over. Hamas is the party rejecting ceasefire negotiations. Hamas does not want an end to the war. They want dead Israelis and dead Jews. And they have vowed to repeat the atrocities of October 7th over and over again. Number three, one of the main reasons why protesters want a local ceasefire resolution is to fuel hatred against Jews and Israelis in our community. These intimidation tactics are promoting hate at a dangerous level. Anti-Semitism has increased by 400% since October 7th. It's evident that criticisms of Israel are often a disguise for blatant anti-Semitism. Your ceasefire vote would normalize hate. Protesters' slogans normalize hate calling for intifada, violent uprisings, from the river to the sea, which is the complete eradication of Israel. We don't want two states, we want 48. Again, the destruction of Israel are all calls to incite violence. Thank this you. war is not just about land, it's a holy war against Jews and ultimately the West and democracy. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Uh, Maxi S, followed by Ryan Jones. Hello. Is there, I've never oh. done this before, and I kind of can't believe I'm here. My, um, my seventh grader plays baseball for Oceanside American, and he's at Melba Bishop right now. I'm in charge of the walk-up songs, the pump them up songs, and they really need it because they haven't won one game yet. <laughs> but I'm here because on my son's phone, he showed me a video of a fight that took place at Lincoln Middle School in the bathroom. It was a bite that was so bad that one of the kids had to be airlifted to the hospital. And it was really crazy because one of the kids got so angry because of some hand gang signs that he thought it was appropriate to completely beat the other kid unconscious. And then you have the third kid who was videoing it and distributing it by text to all the middle schoolers in Oceanside. This is a problem that we can actually do something about. I don't think any kids in Oceanside should be going to middle school and be fearful for their safety. So I'm here to talk to you guys about that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Chief, would you like to talk to her? Thank you. Good evening, City Council. I would like to reject the notion of the previous speaker who said that all further um, talk of a ceasefire resolution should be ignored. It absolutely should not, and that should be a priority of this council as it is a priority of the community here today. For the past several weeks, you've heard from the people of Oceanside, and their voices have been, up until just now, relatively uniform. We demand a ceasefire resolution and the divestment from all investments which support in Israel's genocidal occupation. As of this moment, over 30,000 people have died um, since October 7th in Palestine. Um, and a bigger uh, and a larger growing category is WCNSF, or Wounded Children with No Surviving Family. The fact that this is an acronym which has to exist at all to describe any group of people is insane. But the fact that it is describing such a large group of young people who are being robbed of their digits, limbs, eyes, and most importantly, their childhoods. The fact that this is happening is egregious and insane, and it is our responsibility to say or do something about it. And you, as our representatives, are our voice, and therefore, if the people of Oceanside here say that there must be a resolution for a ceasefire, there must. The crimes of Israel include um, the use of white phosphorus chemical weapons, carpet bombing, clearing of olive groves, filling wells with cement, mass slaying of herds and wildlife, which don't at all sound like the actions of indigenous people on their own lands, or people who care about their own environments, people trying to return into the safety of their land. It sounds like a genocidal colonial force, and the kind that we have seen throughout history be shot down, be turned down, be declared malicious and evil, and it's time that we do this again for the modern genocidal forces that we put up with. Thank you. Thank you very much. Lucy Rios. Hi, good night, City Council. I'm here to speak. I'm here, I'm here to speak and to be the voice of the children of Palestine. 
There are over 74,000 injured people in Gaza. Half of them are children. And this is how they look like. So today, tonight, break your silence tonight. Speak up against the oppression, starvation, the genocide of the Palestinian people, of the children of Gaza. Stand up for human rights tonight. So we can remember you, our city council in Oceanside, for being on the right side of history. Thank you. Thank you very much. That is the end, is that correct? Okay. So I wanna thank you for um, you know, coming back after the break and allowing us to complete our six o'clock item. Um, just a reminder that at six o'clock, we have to, by law, have to take up that item. And the comments are very critical to the decision of the city council. So um, whatever happened, I hope that we can both learn that please, you do have an item that you can speak on, items not on the agenda. Uh, please wait until then. I always come back to it. Uh, I actually could have waited until six o'clock to take that item up, and then the first eight people would have had to wait. So uh, thank you again. So now we are on item number 33, which is adoption of ordinance to amend chapter five, the Oceanside City Code to align the city code with changes in laws, regulations, and best practices concerning the operation of regulated mobility devices, including e-bikes within the city limits. And this was introduced on March 13th with a 5-0. Okay. We, um, we do have public on this item. Okay, how many? A two. Okay, let's get started. Our first speaker is Samia N, to be followed by Ella Rivera. Okay, this is on um, the uh, bikes and e-bikes. Sa Samia N. Okay, how about Ella Rivera? Okay, it looks like we do not have those speakers. So um, there was a motion to adopt, and I believe there was a second. Any other requests to speak? No, okay, uh, Mr. Uh, Mullen, please title the uh, the ordinance. This is the second reading and adoption of an ordinance of the City Council of the City of Oceanside amending Chapter 5 of the City Code to incorporate changes regarding the operation of mobility devices. Thank you, let's vote. Motion approved, 5-0. Thank you, finally, last item is a general council member comments. Uh, Council Member Joyce. Just brief updates from recent meetings. So last night the Housing Commission met and they had a really um, wonderful discussion about the tenant protections ordinance and uh, uh, plans that staff are bringing back to us at our next meeting. They talked a lot about uh, what could be uh, included in our own TPO, what's going to be included in the new state laws that are going into effect ac actually April 1st. Um, new protections for uh, renters are going into effect. So I just uh, urge my council member uh, colleagues and the mayor, uh, review that video because it's hard for me to summarize all of the feedback that they gave. It was very um, comprehensive and it was a really good conversation. So I think it's really worth your time if you have a chance. And then the other update is uh, kind of an update from the trip to DC that um, I was able to go on with our staff. We uh, were asking our legislator, Mike Levin, to uh, make sure that he um, fixed the problem that we were having with the Army Corps of Engineers, where they were unable to finish the study that they owe us with the money that was allocated for it. And there was a legislative fix, uh, thanks to our lobbying group and thanks to Mike Levin for following through on this problem. Uh, and the legislative fix now allows the Army Corps to accept more of our money to finish the study, which is a really important study for our long-term uh, coastline health. So that's all I have for the updates for council member reports. Thank you very much. Council member Robinson. Thank you, Mayor. Um, just because council member Joyce asked, I'll give you a quick update on NCTD. I did go to the board of directors Ooh. meeting on the 21st, and that was the first meeting where the new CEO, Sean Donnie, was there. And he comes to us from uh, CTRAN. He was the CEO for CTRAN, which is a um, similar type organization in Vancouver, Washington. So the meeting was pretty short. There wasn't anything significant on that agenda. And on the 22nd, I went to uh, Burbank um, 
for Cal Cities uh, on their pub uh, as a representative to their public safety committee. And um, when I get all the information back and the highlights, I'm, I'm gonna forward that to council so you can see all the various bills and things and their recommendations and stuff. So that'll be coming uh, soon, hopefully. And lastly, I just wanna say on Saturday the 23rd, I went to a ribbon cutting event at Solutions for Change in uh, Vista. And the, the interesting thing there, that's a organization that gets people out of homelessness and um, they take no government funds. But what was interesting, I think, although it's in Vista, they told me about 60% of their clients come from Oceanside or have some tie to Oceanside. So uh, if you haven't been to uh, Solutions for Change in Vista, I strongly encourage you to go check them out and see what they do. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Deputy Mayor Kime. For Council Member Joyce's request, I'm, I'm happy to update you on Sand Egg. It's very exciting every other Friday. Um, <laughs> last Friday, we adopted, uh, we adopted, or we didn't adopt, we passed the draft budget. We're going to come back, obviously, in a couple months for the final. Um, I have serious concerns that it's very South San Diego centric spending. We have projects that we've been waiting for since Transnet passed in 2004. They're voter approved, like the 78 5 interchange, the I 5 lanes, 78 lanes. And just for an example, the I-578, uh, which I think should have been done long ago, we don't have design and engineering budget until fiscal years 29 and 30. So um, I made it very clear that I'm gonna have problems passing the final budget if we don't move up some of our funding. Because we have big projects that aren't voter approved in San Diego worth hundreds of millions that are going forward and we're still waiting for these projects to be done. And on top of that, we have an emergency or a, a um, a last minute meeting this Friday to address the, the toll road issues on SR 125 um, and see if those are also uh, issues on the 15th. Oh, oh and one, one piece of very good news, we did pass um, the environmental design for the regional beach sand um, three project. So our uh, cities up and down the coast pitched in money for the studies. Hopefully we can get it going the next few years. Thank you. Um, we, we did have, um, I did invite Caltrans to go to the meeting for the South O um, group um, because they're very interested in uh, the status of the I-578, uh, the community um, for South O, um, do, do not want to fly over. In fact, a lot has changed since um, um, in the last 10 years, especially having to do with uh, requirements and greenhouse gas and uh, uh, vehicle miles uh, traveled. And uh, so the announcement was that they are now moving forward um, on the environmental. Um, they're gonna be uh, starting up the uh, public, public information part of this project. Um, they are going to be studying the different alternatives in the EIR. Uh, but they are well aware that our community does not want to fly over. Um, they also gave updates on uh, the projects that they are moving forward on, including uh, the extension of the one lane each way on, the, on five, the, which will go all the way to 76. Um, they also talked about the one, one lane added um, on each side on on 78, which will be something that they are moving forward on. So pretty much they gave kind of a timeline where all of this is, is happening, but definitely um, they are moving on the I-578 in terms of the EIR, which has to happen first. Um, best wishes to everyone during this holy week. Um, different uh, faiths uh, celebrate and or observe this week um, in, in very uh, different ways, but in the end, the hope is for um, everyone to um, for peace. This meeting is adjourned until Wednesday, April 10th. Thank you.